tech check. All right, well, I'm going to take the opposite tech. If you ask somebody to mention a sophisticated technology they use every day, what they will probably give you is something like this, a smartphone. But I would argue this is only the second most sophisticated technology you use every day, that life is, in fact, much, much more sophisticated technology. And let's look at a comparison. If you want to build that chip in your cell phone, you need a factory like this. It costs billions of dollars. It's full of complicated equipment, and it has to be kept enormously clean because a single speck of dust will destroy the entire product. In contrast, biology works fine in environments like this. Where there's no requirement for cleanliness or, or complexity. Furthermore, life learns and adapts in a way we, we only wish our gadgets could. This is a worm. It's C. elegans up in the corner. 302 neurons in the whole animal. That's it. And the graph shows that if you, if you take the, uh, the dish in which it lives and you tap it repeatedly, how often it jumps. Now, if you look at the y-axis, the first time you tap the dish, they all jump. By the 10th time, they figured out this is harmless and they no longer jump. In terms of machine learning, this is spectacular performance. It learned a practical result in 10 trials, unsupervised. And it did this with 300 neurons. Furthermore, life does an amazing job of recognizing objects from partial and incomplete data. And it does that because for life, this is a life and death problem. I'm going to show a picture, figure out how long it takes you to recognize what's there. Right? What is that? It's a snake, right? Obvious. But that's a very, very hard vision problem. You're only seeing part of the snake. The part that you see is obscured. The remainder of it is out of focus. It's got unknown stuff in the foreground. It's a 2D representation, and you don't know the lighting. Right? There probably isn't a vision program in the world that can do that. And yet, it's so easy for people that we use it online every time we shop to tell a person from a machine. Because this is something that, 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 that uh, machines do, do poorly and people easily. So how do these systems work? Well, the obvious way to do it is say, maybe we can do the same task ourselves, and maybe that's how biology does it. And that works great for some things. For example, just by thinking about it, we have machines that play brilliant chess. But they don't do it the way that people does it. Other problems, like vision, we've been working on for half a century. And we still don't have anything that works nearly as well as biology. And so instead, it's time to study the brain, figure out how it does it, and copy those methods. It's much easier to copy than to invent. Now, there's another reason to study the brain, which is, of course, people's brains often malfunction. And there's all sorts of brain diseases, depression, addiction, and so on. Billions of people in the world, about a billion people, suffer from this. And that's another reason to study it. Because from an engineering or medicine point of view, how can you fix something if you don't know how it works? Our current methods are, at best, trial and error, and in fact, more like voodoo in, in many cases. And so this is such an obvious case to make that even politicians recognize that we should study the brain. And so here you see them the announcing it. And we use many, many methods. If you look at the, the methods that are used, they're structural. We do reverse engineering. We use genetics. We look at behavior. Electrophysiology is measuring the electrical performance of the brain. Imaging, lineage, I'll talk about these. And I'm going to talk only about the double E ones, although the genetic ones are really impressive. Now, nervous systems and double E has a lot of similarities. They both collect inputs, apply a nonlinearity, and generate an output. And so that means that double E techniques are really good for studying the brain. And conversely, maybe what we learn from the brain can be used to improve our double E. So first, I'll talk about some of my own research, which is reverse engineering the brain. Now, it turns out a fly, if you present an otherwise neutral odor and a shock, the fly will learn to avoid that. Once you do this, the fly thinks that that odor is unpleasant and will turn around and go the other way. And the opposite happens for a pleasant experience, right? The fly is attracted to it. And through genetic techniques and uh, electron microscope, we actually have a system-level diagram of how this works. What happens is on, the, on the, uh, this side, left for you guys, I guess, the uh, olfactory signals come in. First, they get all factory signals of like type get summed. That's to increase the signal to noise. Then it generates a sparse representation over thousands of neurons of this. That goes to the boxes you see there labeled alpha and beta. In these boxes, whenever a pleasant or unpleasant thing happens, that one remembers that sparse representation. And the next time that representation occurs, the fly will avoid it or, or, or be attracted to it. And this particular part here, we examined with an electron microscope and took it all apart and came up with a detailed circuit. In this case, 1,100 neurons and 20, 200,000 synapses. And this is the first time we have an understanding at a mechanistic level of how any sort of memory or learning in an animal occurs. There's lots of projects like this, similar projects in size, thousands of neurons, hundreds of thousands of connections, 
had the retina, the optic lobes, the larva, the thing. And at the rate of improvement we got now, in five years, we're going to have the whole fly. 100K neurons, 100 million synapses. Now, let's talk about how another way double E is used. This is a cool picture. This is a zebrafish larva. The, the zebrafish is used because the larva is transparent. You can see through it. In this case, using genetic techniques, there's a dye placed in every cell that fluoresces when there's high levels of calcium. And high levels of calcium happen when the neuron fires. And so what you're seeing here is you're actually watching the zebrafish think. And this is done with 3D imaging. So it's doing slices and then through the volume. It's got cameras that take 2K by 2K images at 200 frames per second. And the microscope has 12 of those. And so we're talking at uh, something on the order of 8 to 10 gigabytes per second. So you need a lot of EE, a lot of computer science, and a lot of cluster computing and GPUs to analyze this data. Now, the next place that EE helps is looking at electrical activity in the brain. This is the old technology. Before you stick electrodes in the brain, you bring the wires out, and you amplify it externally. It has exactly the problems you would think. Hundreds of wires, limited bandwidth, bad connectors, sites far apart. So a bunch of people got together. These are four charitable foundations and the University College of London worked with IMEC Technology in Belgium, Belgium to build a chip that does this better. And it's the weirdest looking chip you've ever seen. That's the actual shape of the chip. It's got that square thing plus this tiny little spike that sticks out. And on the spike are these little pads you can see up in the upper right. And those, uh, the spike gets embedded in the brain, and those little pads pick up the signals from the neurons that are near the, near the connections. The back part is a bunch of electronics that records and samples those signals. As a double E, you're doubtless familiar with, it, with how it works. It's, it's standard analog electronics. You pick up the signals on the, on the pads, you amplify them, you mux them, you run them to the main computing part where it's amplified and then filtered, then D to A or A to D, uh, serialized, and run it on the cable. As a result, when you put this in an animal, we now get many more sites we can, we can look at and much higher signal quality. So this is going to revolutionize brain research. Another thing, you're going to hear about VR later, but we can actually use it for serious research purposes as well as games. In this case, you'd like to study the brain of a moving animal. You know, it moves around, but it's hard because those probes don't work very well and microscopes don't work very well if you have a, a, like a mouse that's moving around. And so instead, what you do is you hold the animal in place, you measure it as it tries to move, and then you project in front of it to make it think that it's moving. And so this is basically, it's, it's the matrix implemented for animals. And uh, it, it actually works. Here, I'll show you a cool movie. In this case, down at the bottom, there's a mouse. You can see the mouse? His head is fixed into this microscope and these electrodes that's measuring those waveforms you see on the other side of the brain. As he tries to move, he's on a styrofoam ball. The ball rotates and moves sideways. We calculate how it moves, and that maze you see in the background is projected as if the, as if the mouse is really moving. And as far as we can tell, the mouse does, can't tell the difference between a real, a real maze and this maze. And so you know, this really works. Think about that when you're working on yourself, right? Maybe, maybe someone else is uh, saying it. Um, it also works for flies. They're glued to that little stick you see in there. And a zebrafish is even more matrix-like because the zebrafish is stuck in a little tube. It can't even move its tail. But since we're watching the nerves, we can figure out it's trying to move its tail and then move the scene accordingly as if it's swimming. And just like in the matrix, we can adjust those strengths till the, till the fish has superhuman strength or no strength at all. He's under our control. So once we decipher all this stuff, how are we going to get into our electronics? That's the next question. I'm going to look at two paths, software and hardware. And it's possible we don't have to do anything in our hardware because it's possible that the hardware is already capable enough. Maybe it's that we just don't know the software. And that's entirely unclear whether to get biological performance, you need neurons, or could you do it with regular conventional electronics? That, that's unclear. Um, an existence proof for just software would be AlphaGo. You probably heard about this. It's a program that recently uh, beat the world's expert in Go. And if you read the paper, this could have been done 30 years ago if we knew how. Uh, using their, their neural network there, they can evaluate in three milliseconds what it took previous programs 45 seconds to do. So it's a 15,000 times improvement. And so this program could have played a good game ago on 1985 hardware and an excellent game ago on 1995 hardware when we had the first Beowulf clusters. And so it's entirely possible that our cell phones and stuff are powerful enough now, we just don't know how to program them. And I think if there's a reason for that, it's because people only think about a fraction of the possible topologies. If you look up neural net in Wikipedia, you see something like that. And deep learning, this big thing from Google and Facebook, is based on exactly the same idea, just more of it. Like AlphaGo here has a 13-layer neural network, thousands of variables in each layer, but it's exactly the same idea. And it's trained by back, back propagation, which is not a biologically plausible technique. 
On the other hand, the biology networks that we find are extremely different. Here's a, here's a network of cells we find in the first layer of the visual system. And here's the feed-forward connections. This is the only kind of connection that AlphaGo or neural networks use, just this. But if you look at biology, it's also full of bidirectional connections that look like this. It's full of same-layer connections that look like that. And it's even full of reverse connections that, that go opposite in the network. And we really don't understand how networks that contain these connections work or how they're trained. But it's very likely, we believe, that this is what results in the difference in performance on tasks like image recognition. That you know, in, the, in the image recognition in people, the snake works its way up your visual chain, and then the features that define the snake are, are emphasized down at the lower layers. And so we think that this is a, a possibility. Now, if hardware is needed, it, it turns out there are a lot of people working on that, too. Stanford has a project called Brains in Silicon where they build big analog electronics. IBM has a project called True North where they build big digital neurons and then talk to each other over a big event-driven framework. And there's also a technique called memristor-based learning, which I'll, I'll do a little more detail on because I think it's a, a possibility for chips in the future. It's based on something called spike timing-dependent plasticity. And it, it's a system in biological techniques they can learn while they're operating. Now, the idea of spike timing-dependent plasticity is pretty simple. Say you have a neuron that's getting input that comes in like this, right? Now, if the neuron, if this one spikes before this one, the output neuron, you say, aha, that was a good predictor. Predictor, we should strengthen that connection. Similarly, if the output spikes and then the input comes in, you say, well, that was too late. That's not helpful. We should weaken that connection. And that's exactly what you see on the graph here, that depending on when the two signals occur, the synapse gets stronger or weaker. And it turns out we can do exactly that with memristors. Now, there's lots of kinds of memristors, but I'll talk about one very briefly here. The memristor is a, a resistor with memory. And so the idea is for small voltages, the voltage, which is drawn there in blue, and the current in red are strictly proportional. But if you get a big enough voltage, the, the resistor becomes stronger, higher conductance, and the next time you apply the same voltage, you get more current. That's shown on the left. Similarly, if you apply a big negative voltage, then the resistor becomes weaker, less conductance, and the next time you apply the, the voltage, you get less current. So it, it's a resistor with memory. Now, given that, you can actually build a structure that looks very much like the brain. The, the structure is the matrix shown there <coughs> on the left. And in this matrix, there's a memristors at the junctions. The input signals are vertical, and the output signals are horizontal. And so because the memristors are resistors, each output gets a weighted sum of the inputs with the weights determined by the memristors. Now, if we put spikes on those signals with waveforms, as shown there, if the waveforms happen at the same time, there's no voltage across the memristor, and nothing happens to the learning. If the pre-signal happens before the post, which is good, then it turns out the way those signals sum, you get the area shown in green, and the connection becomes stronger. Conversely, if they happen in the wrong order, then the voltages add up differently, the, the negative voltage is negative, and the connection becomes weaker. And so what that can do, if you have an M by M matrix of these memristors, which you could even do at the junction of individual wires, or they're that small, you can adjust m squared weights in one cycle. And, so, and also, it happens while it's operating. So this is a way we might be able to get these amazing learning stuff that biology can do into electronics. Now, let me end up with two points. The first point is opposite of Chuck. You should consider becoming a brain researcher. It turns out that a biology background is not mandatory. In my group at Genelia, eight out of 10 people are CS, EE, or physics backgrounds. Only 20% are actually biologists. And second, I think this is the golden age of neuroscience, right? Finally, we have some chance to understand the brain. The tools are finally equal to the task. These new tools are, are getting there. And the field is ripe for breakthroughs. So if you want to build the next killer app like this, even better than sliced bread, or if you want to win the next Nobel Prize, this is the area to go for, right? There's lots of these that can be, that can be found here. And so let me leave you with my final thought then, which is suppose you want to improve electronics. And that's why you're here, right? You want to improve electronics? Well, don't study electronics. If you want the next breakthrough, you should study the brain. Thank you very much. What? I, I, I. Thank you, Lou. Right. Um, I guess I, I owe you an apology. That, <laughs> but, but, but to be fair, you're actually just doing design. That's so as true. long as you're just doing design, then mm -hmm. you're doing all right. So all right. I appreciate it. I want to all thank right. you for, uh, for right. your wonderful right. talk.